Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Dr. Swindoll served uh, Dallas Seminary well as his fourth president and is known for, uh, by many for his practical application of, of the scriptures to everyday living. And he now serves as our chancellor here at the seminary and is currently the senior pastor at Stonebriar Community Church in Frisco, Texas, just kind of northwest of here, about 25 miles. Uh, Dr. Swindoll has written more than 50 books and is featured Bible teacher on the popular radio program Insight for Living, which many of you know. It's aired nearly 2,000 times a day worldwide. And his desire is to establish the church with a solid biblical foundation based on the faithful exposition of the Word of God. And his vision includes the importance of corporate worship and an emphasis on small group ministries that provide encouragement and accountability in the body. And he and his wife, Cynthia, reside here in the Metroplex and love to spend much of their time with their four children and their 10 grandchildren. Let's welcome our Chancellor, Dr. Swindoll, as he comes today. God bless you, brother. Thank you. He didn't often, Bill and I, sing together. We, uh, we did that one time before, really. We were at a camp out uh, in West Texas, and, and uh, we decided to sing My Old Kentucky Home. And a couple in the back began to cry as we sang. And uh, I saw them later, and I said, are you from Kentucky? They said, no, we're musicians. And so <laughs> we, don't, we, don't, we don't sing that often together as a result. Every preacher can remember his first sermon, unfortunately. Uh, one of the seminary professors who isn't here today, so I can tell the story on him without calling his name, told uh, us in our class that uh, his first sermon, he, he brought about 20 to 25 pages of notes with him in his Bible. Does that sound like a Dallas Seminary prof or what? And he said, when I opened my Bible on this little pulpit, all the pages fell on the floor, and it was then I realized I had not numbered the pages. <laughs> we remember moments like that. No longer with us, but uh, certainly glorifying his Lord in heaven, S. Lewis Johnson told a story in our Greek class of when he, when he was very young and was just, I mean, young in ministry, and he said, the only place I would ever dare to preach was out in the country which is a great idea, a good place to start. And he said, I was in this little country church of maybe 30 people were there at the most. And he said, just as I stood up at the pulpit to begin to preach, the back doors blew open and in came a whole herd of goats <laughs> down into, into the building. Can you believe that? He said, from all of us just rolled our sleeves up and get rid of the goats. He said, since then I've been taking goats away from sheep all this, all this time. And he said, it was a never to be forgotten experience. One of my earliest sermons was at a local funeral home. It's a true story. I was a student here and they didn't know that, that I wasn't fairly experienced. I was not experienced at all. And they called the school and somebody administration got a hold of me and asked if I'd preach a funeral for a man who really had no family. In fact, we would be at the funeral home, be very small gathering, and that encouraged me. So I said, sure, I'll, I'll go do that. And I showed up, and you know who was there? The man's uh, attorney and his fox terrier sitting in, in, in the attorney's lap. <laughs> that was my audience. <laughs> I didn't know whether to preach on obedience or greed as I stood <laughs> looked out on the group of people. I read some time ago about a young preacher that was asked to, uh, by a funeral director to preach a, a, a graveside service for a homeless man. He said, there'll be no one there, it'll be very small out in the country, but he said, if you'd be willing to go, it's kind of a pauper's cemetery, a long ways from nowhere, and he said, uh, 
I'd appreciate it very much. And he said, sure, I'll do that. Well, he got lost. And he wormed his way through one road after another and finally, finally found a, a place where there's a mound of dirt. Everybody had already left. And, and the, the uh, diggers were sitting on a mound of dirt eating lunch, if you can picture that. And uh, he walked over and he looked down. And he saw that the cover of the vault was already in place. And he thought, well, I'm here and they're there. And uh, I might as well deliver this. So he did. And he really got passionate about it. And, and he poured himself into it. And toward the end, he, he just felt like he ought to break into song. And so he sang a stanza of Amazing Grace. And they all stood up, put their caps over their heart, and had their heads kind of bowed. And they sang with him. And he prayed. It was all over. And he walked slowly back to his pickup truck to get in. As he heard one of the diggers say, you know, uh, that beats anything I've ever seen in my life. And uh, I've been putting in septic tanks for 30 years. <laughs> I, think the, I think the moral of that story is you need to know who your audience is <laughs> if you're going to be preaching. And I know for some of you, when you hear the word preaching, you, you get a chill up your back because you can't imagine yourself ever doing what we do regularly. And what you've heard others do, your pastor, who has probably had a, a hand in your being here, and the impact of other, other people who spoke, who taught, who preached. And so I want to talk a little bit about uh, that from the life of a 30-year-old preacher who certainly knew what he was doing. As a matter of fact, his delivery was flawless. He knew his audience better than they knew himself. And even though he was just getting underway in this region, not far from where he had been reared as a lad, uh, he did not really, uh, he had not met the people personally, but he was, he was there to deliver the truth of God to those who would listen. And his name, of course, is Jesus. And the, and the record of his early ministry is in the first chapter of Mark. Uh, uh, if I'd like to have you turn there, about the middle of the chapter, I want to look at a few verses. But understand, this is not the first recorded message of Jesus. That would be Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the, the now immortal Sermon on the Mount, which is worth your study. It's worth a lifetime of study. But this is not that. This is a, th this is a rather brief, which is like Mark, uh, a rather brief account of, of Jesus who uh, comes on the scene somewhat abruptly, unannounced, and he doesn't as yet have any disciples. He, is, uh, he has been baptized by John the baptizer in the Jordan, and he has found his way back through to uh, the, the land, the region of Galilee, northern part of the land we know today as Israel. And, uh, and he comes on the scene uh, where John uh, uh, had left his mark on some of the people, but not most. And we read verse 16 of uh, verse 14, after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God. Uh, let's not get in a hurry here and, and rush to the end of this. Let's pause and, and, and look at what we are reading. Jesus came into Galilee preaching. The word is a word that appears again a number of times, but you'll recall it from uh, the motto of Dallas Seminary, preach the word in 2 Timothy 4, 2. Caruso conveys the idea of making a proclamation representing someone in authority. Uh, it would be a word used for the town crier in ancient days. It would be for someone who would come into the town square before there, there was print. 
and announce the edict of the, of the monarch or the authority of the community. He was the Kerusan. Keru, he was the Kerux is the word for the, the de, one who would declare the message. Uh, Jesus didn't come and engage them in a discussion. He didn't uh, involve uh, uh, others uh, as participants in this message. He preached. Uh, the reason I, I, I am driving home the point is because increasingly more so in this generation, I'm, I'm hearing less and less positive statements made about the importance of preaching, the importance of taking people into the truth and declaring the message. I have to tell you, I have been in more group gatherings than I can count, and I today remember very, very few of them, maybe enough to number on one hand. That really was for me transforming, but I can tell you dozens of preached messages that gripped me and turned my direction toward a, a whole new dimension of life. I can even give you their outlines on occasion. I can declare, of course, who delivered it and get pretty close to when it was in my life that I heard it and why it impacted me. A carefully well-prepared Delivered message of the truth is life impacting. Don't let anyone, either here or elsewhere, uh, dissuade you otherwise or persuade you otherwise. Stay with the importance of the, the preaching of the Word of God. If that is your, your realm of giftedness, uh, work at it, pray over it, cultivate it, learn about it. Study other preachers, read them, uh, include them in your library. And, and this message, I, I, I wish we had it in its complete form, but uh, probably just an abbreviated statement regarding it is what Mark gives us. He came, verse 14, preaching. And what was he preaching? He was preaching the good news of God. He was declaring the good news in a day when the information around them from their culture was sad and discouraging in a day when uh, when wrong was on the throne uh, at a time when uh, truth was not being heard and uh, those who took the time to un unroll the scroll bored their audiences to tears with needless details and other quotations that were unrelated to life, Jesus comes with the good news. He gives them truth as opposed to deception. He gives them a, a message of peace as opposed to chaos and, and, and emptiness. He gives them hope and immortality in this message. And he tells them of, of its urgency when he says the time is fulfilled. The, the kingdom of God is at hand. Uh, in other words, it is an occasion for you to act upon the message. Uh, one of the differences between mere teaching, and I don't mean mere uh, derogatorily, but the difference between teaching and the preaching of the, of the word is that there is an urgency in the preached message. The audience, is, the audience who is listening, the congregation, is, is being brought to a place of decision. And uh, uh, please, it isn't always a decision to receive Christ, though that certainly is part of it. But when you are in a church as a pastor, your role is to equip the saints with the message of truth. And you deliver it in a way that, that is urgent and relevant so that people understand how uh, up to date God's word is. I've said for years, we don't make the word relevant. It, it already is relevant. It's our job to help people see how relevant it is and where it is relevant in their lives. And so he comes preaching this message. He tells them the kingdom of God is at hand. And he even has the audacity to say to them, repent, change your mind, turn around. 
He implies in that you're moving in the wrong direction, turn to the right direction, and uh, believe in the gospel. I'm sure you expect me to say that, and so I don't want to let you down. I'm going to say that if you give people something to believe, you have given them the gospel. Something to believe. Don't front load it and don't back load it. Make sure when you give them the gospel, they understand it is the message of grace. Christ has paid the penalty for our sins and that payment is complete and finished. And for a person to receive the gospel is to accept the finished work of Christ, not to attempt to add to it. Uh, I, I, I'm talking to the choir today. Uh, most of you know that. Most of you were reared under that kind of preaching. M m however, we are in the minority. Most people I'm around still believe there's something they must do or there's something they must add to that message in order for God to be pleased with them. The whole message of justification by faith in Christ alone, by faith alone, because of grace alone, uh, is, is being missed in our day. And be sure, as you preach on weekends or as you leave this place to deliver the message, wherever God may use you in your future ministry, be sure that when you deliver the gospel, you help them understand it is what they are to simply believe, accept it. Act upon it. Change the mind from that direction to this direction. And moving in that direction, trust Christ completely. Used to have a man in our church uh, at Stonebriar who had been from uh, a long, a long uh, history of evangelistic ministry. And it was great to have him among us. He's now gone. But he would say to me on occasion, be sure you, you use the word complete. He has paid the penalty completely for our sins. Be sure you make that clear, Chuck. And, and Jesus simply says, uh, repent and believe the good news. And that's what he brings to these people here in uh, Galilee. So there is a ministry of preaching, a ministry of proclamation. Don't sell it short. Don't let anyone convince you that it isn't effective. Uh, be assured that God will use the preached word in, in one life after another. And uh, believe it or not, even in some very young lives who will hear the truth being presented. People long to know what the truth is because they long to have their lives transformed. And in this postmodern era, truth is always hanging in the balance uh, you are one of the places, the pulpit is one of the places where you can declare a message that is politically incorrect and it'll be appreciated. They long for it. So Jesus delivers that kind of message and he isn't finished with simply preaching. He also has in mind a plan for mentoring. Please observe how that unfolds. As he was going along, verse 16 tells us, as he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew. Now, it's possible that the two men have heard him elsewhere. Mark doesn't include that, but perhaps they have. But I doubt that they had met this closely and had a face-to-face -face encounter with the one who has come to Galilee to, uh, to be the Kerux of God. Uh, so they, they look up from their, from their nets, and there he stands. Observe, they are casting a net in the sea, for they are fishermen. That's all they know. They lived at Capernaum. They, they fished the sea. They were men of the sea. They understood fishing. And he said to them, in light of that, follow me, I will make you become fishers of men. Isn't that interesting how he held out that invitation using words they would understand. They understood fishing. But they had spent their lives fishing for fish. And so had John, the father of Peter, 
and, uh, uh, and, and Andrew, uh, and we'll see in a few moments. So had James and John and their father, Zebedee. Fishing was their work. It was their world. Jesus said, I invite you to move in another direction. But it begins with following me. Notice that comes first. Follow me. I will make you become fishers of men. Uh, the beauty of this is that some of the principles that work for fishing for fish would be the same as fishing for men and women. No need to get in that, but that's a, perfect, that's a great opportunity for you if you were delivering this message to go into the analogy between fishing for fish and fishing for people. Uh, and, and Jesus draws upon that by using the words, I will make you become fishers of men. They hear his words. They are not complicated. They are not difficult to understand. They're clear. They're direct. And it's, it's obvious that, that uh, he's sincere. Mark uses his favorite word in the next verse by telling us immediately they left their nets and followed him. I find that remarkable. I find that amazing. Put yourself in their shoes. Maybe you were there somewhat recently. You who are first year students. Engaged in your world, engaged in your work, the familiar haunts of your life. This is not your city, you were reared elsewhere. This is not your state, you were born and reared in another state. This certainly isn't the context of your life where you find yourself today, this is all unfamiliar. But the Lord found you where you were and in his own inimitable way, he said to you, you follow me. The implication is I'm going to lead you to do what you do not now know how to do. Follow me, I will make you become fishers of men. It clicks. He's not starting a school. He's not beginning a seminary. This is not another rabbinical course in the Torah. This is a whole different genre of training. He doesn't spell it out. One of the great things about our Savior is always, he always knows more than he reveals. And he knows us better than we've ever given him credit. He looks back on our lives and sees it all. And still he calls us. Still he reaches out and says to us, you follow me. It's the first step toward uh, a mentorship, a mentoring experience is the one who extends the invitation, deliberately selects you to be a part of the group. We read elsewhere in Mark chapter, actually chapter three, uh, where he, he, he called to himself 12, those that he wanted, we read, and that they might be with him, that he might send them out to preach. Notice the order. First is to be with him. That's what you're doing at this school. That's a period of time and let it run its course. Uh, don't get antsy. Dig in. Stay at it. He is in the process of preparing you to become fishers of men and women. And so it begins with your following him. You have started that journey. And you have done so by faith. For some of you, it has represented a remarkable step of faith. You stepped away from uh, a, uh, perhaps a position where there was a fairly good salary. Uh, I said earlier, a world that is familiar. Uh, my coming to Dallas Seminary was out of a military background and before that, uh, mechanical engineering uh, and, and, a, and a good job waiting for me once I got out of the Marine Corps. And I remember saying to my wife uh, in, in a letter I sent her from uh, Okinawa, I said, I, I need to tell you that I, 
I, I don't believe I should return to that job. I think I should go back to school. And, and in fact, I'm thinking about Dallas Seminary. Well, she was thrilled. Uh, and, and I said that to her just early this morning over coffee. I said, you know, the wonderful thing about life with you for these 55 years is I've never had to drag you into anything that I sensed God was leading me to do or leading us to do. She said, why would you have to do that? In fact, she said, I wanted to push you at times to get into some stuff that I, I sensed that God was wanting us to do. And you were reluctant about it. She's exactly right. She's loved Christ deeper than I have as I look back over our lives. And uh, uh, boy, the value of a mate in that. Isn't it interesting that Jesus doesn't say, check this out with your relatives and see what they think. Or you might want to talk to your daddy and... Uh, since you're in, in this business with him, or you might want to run this by how your family feels about it. That's why I say it's remarkable. You follow me. So there's risk there. Faith always involves risk. And everything within us recoils against that kind of risk. And yet the greatest things God has for us come at the heels or at the end of the risk. When you look back and say, that was why he was leading us like this. And the longer you're here, the more it'll make sense. If it doesn't, you're in the wrong place. One of the things you do learn while you're going through these courses is whether or not that calling is really a calling. Or whether you just kind of got on the wagon with other people thinking, that might be an interesting uh, profession, please. We don't have a profession to practice. We have a debt. Just as the apostle said, I'm in his debt to repay. They immediately left their nets and, and they followed him. By the way, no unemployment, no, no employment benefits, no insurance, no bonus package at the end of each year. All you guys are sports fans have read the latest on the latest NFL player who's been holding out in the preseason. And he wasn't pleased because he didn't get the 60 million he wanted to settle for 40. Shoot. Isn't that too bad? <laughs> Crimea River. You know, um, you will have none of that. That's foreign to you. I mean, that's their world and they can fight it out. That's not our world. In fact, I'm preaching next Sunday out of Mark chapter 6, where Jesus is no baggage, no extra tunic, just wear sandals. When you go, stay. They don't want to hear you shake the dust off your feet and move on. Boy, that's, that's part of following him. Knowing when to stay and knowing when to move on, that's all part of it. The, Peter and, and, and Andrew don't know any of this. They just stand there with their face hanging out, and they hear Jesus say, you, you two guys, follow me. Oh, okay. And we read, I'll come back to it in a moment. They left their nets. Every time you follow the Savior, you're leaving something that is very f familiar and is a real security to you. Every time. A little later, you'll see James and John leaving their daddy. And all that went with that business, they left it. Immediately they left their nets. So he's beginning the process of selecting his people and, and you're, you're, in that, you're in that select group. What a privilege, huh? We are one of them that he selected. Never forget that. So he comes along and he falls, goes a little further and he sees James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother. So we got Peter and his brother, Simon and his brother, and now we've got John and his brother. And they're in the boat mending nets. Immediately he called them. Here it is. They left their father in the boat with hired servants. That's pretty good business. When you're in the fishing business and you've got people working for you, you're catching a lot of fish. Maybe they had an outlet down in Jerusalem. 
where they ship their fish. Their, uh, their, their fish. Uh, pretty good business. They left it. You're early on, some of you, in your training at the seminary, and it would be a good suggestion that you get past all that you've left and press on. Uh, No time to lick wounds, no time to live in the, it could have been. It is now all about what might be as you give yourself to your training here. Pour yourself into it. Listen to me. This is, your, this is your chance. This is your opportunity. This is your moment. Your place at that desk, your seat in that classroom, your opportunity to sit at the feet of all these guys that have forsaken us and fled. <laughs> these great men and women. What a privilege. Uh, I, I confess to you, I, I'd get there early to get the front seat. And I, when I sit further back, I get distracted. So I was right down there where the prof spits on you, right down in front. And I remember just drinking it in. I, I couldn't get enough. I'd never been around people like this in my life. I mean, I'd come out of Marine Corps barracks. <laughs> you imagine this scholar at a Marine Corps barracks? This, or that, oh, not you, Bill. I was going <laughs> to, you could imagine Bill at one, but... And here I was. Now, why am I lingering here? Because you discount these simple things. You get so accustomed to it, you get cynical. What a terrible attitude to have at a place that some people dream of attending. I know it isn't everything that, that you wanted it to be. You're not everything we wanted you to be. And, 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 and you're here, and we're going to work with you. If you're looking for perfect, go somewhere else. And if you're going to stay here and complain, get out. Because you, you spoil the, the ministry for others around you as you spread your poison. I, I was in my junior year, and I was taking 21 hours, and I was auditing two other courses. We had a new baby. Color me idiotic, Okay. <laughs> And I'd become a little cynical. I was sitting toward the back. Remember that. Here in this chapel. And the man who's now a professor at missions, one of the professors, Ron Blue, was sitting across from me. And I was grousing back there and answering back, kind of acting smart. And he looked over at me and he said, can I talk to you in a few minutes? I said, yeah. I was an upperclassman, you know. I got stuff I could tell him. And we're out in the lobby, and I've, I've never told a story in my life. And I got Ron Blue to thank. He said, you know what? Uh, it would be great uh, if you're that cynical that you just keep it to yourself. Because I, for one, am very excited about what I'm hearing. <laughs> I'll never forget that. And I said to him a few days later, thank you. Thanks for the reproof. You're right. Not only are you called, those around you are called. And I I like it that these brothers got into it together and they left their daddy and they followed him. Well, uh, you've been very patient to listen to these few words. Let uh, Let me ask you three questions. Number one, Where does the Lord find you today? It's obvious where we find you. I know where you're sitting. I know you're here. But where does the Lord find you? Down deep inside. How's your heart? It's uh, hardly September, and and some of you have already begun to form habits that are going to hurt you. And if you want to soar in the days ahead, this is a great place to learn to fly. This is your moment. So where are you? These men were in their boats, holding their nets. They were in a stage of life that quite likely life had become pretty simple and secure for them. Jesus is getting ready to mix all that up, mess all that up. 
He's getting ready to put them in situations where their mouth will drop wide open. He's going to be dealing with demons. He's going to be healing withered hands. He's going to be raising daughters from death. He's going to be changing the lives of the disabled. He's going to be standing before a hostile crowd that wants to kill him. And they're going to be in the shadows watching this. Their master, who's way out there in front. And before long, he's going to have them there preaching and mentoring. And most of them, before they've been counted dead on this earth, will have been in the process of becoming a martyr. Best I can figure it, the great majority of them died a martyr. That's part of following him, isn't it? Where are you right now? Second question. What's the Lord's calling in your life? What is the Lord's calling in your life right now? I, I don't know. If I knew, I'd pull you aside after this and talk to you directly and tell you what it is. I don't know what it is. Well, I'm going to tell you part of what it is. It's pain. It's being misunderstood. It's standing out and make, making a statement for Christ. It's, it's uh, going through the process of the painful experience of dealing with carnal Christians. It's struggling to make your grades. It's hammering away, not knowing how you're going to get, to get your tuition done. That's all out there. And that's okay. It's supposed to be hard. Ministry's tough. And it's best that you learn that early. So the third question is, how long is it going to take you to say yes? When are you going to finally drop the nets? When are you finally going to sever ties with those who are not good for you? Those who are urging you to come back to where you were or to go in a direction that you know in your heart isn't where the Lord's leading. Can I tell you a quick story and I'm through my own life? I was almost 25 years in the same church. It built it from very small to what it became. We were on the West Coast, and our family had been raised there. Our grandkids were being born there. Cynthia and I were doing great together. Our ministry and insight for living was working. It was all working. Here I was, 59 years old, and thinking, oh, how great is this? Finally, finally, we got a staff. I'd hired every one of our staff people. Finally, we got a multiple staff that's working in harmony, great music, great congregations, and, and a turn away crowds, if you will. And uh, I get a phone call from the chairman of Dallas Seminary Board and Dr. Don Campbell. And I, I, I absolutely could not believe it. I, I, at first, you know what I thought? I thought it's two guys in the back office faking their voices and, <laughs> and acting like they were doing that. So I laughed. They didn't laugh. And, and I, uh, when I listened to them, they said, we'd like you to consider uh, being a candidate as the president of the Dallas Seminary. I said, you are. <laughs> Not only are you uh, nuts, you guys are losing it quickly. And you, I'm concerned for you. And <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. Come on. Uh, and they said, well, would you pray about it? Don't you hate it when they ask you something like that? And of course, I'll pray about it. And I just knew it would be no. The Lord said, good for you. You're where I want you, and you're, everything's going well, and just keep on. And I went home. I said to Cynthia, would you believe? And I told her, she said, sounds like a good idea to me. Come on. <laughs> And I, I told them no again. And I told them no the third time. They said, well, will you serve on the candidating, uh, on, the, on the search committee? I said, yeah, I'm on the board. I'll be glad to search for the one the Lord wants to have here. And under, I'm 59. You know? 
And, and listen to this. Lewis Berry Chafer, John F. Walford, Donald K. Campbell, Chuck Swindoll. <laughs> just look at that. I'm serious. And we went through that search process, and I won't even go into all of that, but it was like, a, it was like slam dunk clear. And I dismissed myself from the search committee. And I said, I, in fact, I had my eyes filled with tears. I said, I cannot believe this. And I took an early flight home. And I met with about seven or eight very, very close friends from all over the country. And uh, I said, yes. It was one of the most uh, disillusioning time for our staff because everybody wanted to know what was wrong. Nothing's wrong. Something have to be wrong to follow Jesus? No, nothing's wrong. Yeah, but we thought, I know, I thought that too. Well, you promised. I know. I say a lot of dumb things. <laughs> He's telling me to do this. So what I tell you today, that's just one of about a dozen I could tell you. And in the middle of that calling is an incredible surprise factor that you'll find yourself just quickly gagging on the word, no, 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 not there. When we got out of Dallas Seminary, Cynthia and I talked to each other and, and I determined there's three places I'm not gonna be ministering. Texas, New England, California. Looking back, the only places I've ministered are Texas and New England and California. So she says, don't tell him we won't go to Alaska. <laughs> She's cold all the time. You know what? I'm crazy about what you're about to be doing. I'm not envious of you. I've been there. I know a little of what you have in front of you, and I want to tell you it is worth every moment, every hour, every painful occasion, every tear every disappointment, every tough course, every moment of it. As I look back at age 75, soon to be 76, I'm telling you, as I look back, it, it is the only way to live. Follow his call. Do it. Father, um, help us to know what it means to follow you. Give us the courage to say, I've decided to do that. And then having decided that, keep us from looking back over our shoulder and wondering what if, but rather looking ahead and asking what's next. And use these simple words in a special way to lead these men and women toward a life of obedience, faithfulness, and service. In the name of Jesus.